What's going on, y'all? This is Yadon Israel, literary swag extraordinaire, importer of the literary, exporter of the swag. This is another <laughs> episode of Lit, the premier platform for all things literary, swaggy, and in between today's guest, we have the super poetic, super fly, Mahogany L. Brown. Give a round of applause for coming. And Mahogany came super swaggy today. A little um, bit. We got we to open the, the outfit. All right. We'll talk about this. Pop it open. All right. Show so uh, we got. the skirt is from Harlem, the sister run organization. Uh, it's a Thule Empire Way situation. Okay. And we have uh, the cobalt blue flats, yes, just yes, in case yes. I need to go get some parking so, after this. So it's all fly done. is knocking books down. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, yeah. And then I have a handmade uh, African shirt from the Brothers on Nostrand Avenue. And, then the, then the, then the and the head wrap. wrap is from Oakland, California. All right. Imported. <laughs> imported. Imported. <laughs> Fresh off the boat. Fresh off um, the boat. So, yes. From my home. Tell us about growing up in Oakland. Okay. Um, Oakland was interesting. Uh, I grew up in Oakland, uh, West Oakland, and uh, went to school in Sacramento, which was about an hour away. My mother, she got a little nervous about, you know, how things could be and uh, decided to show us different ways. But I always go home to Oakland where my family is from, my father, mm. my father's parents, and uh, sit on 32nd and Helen and learn about the town. Uh, I learned to play basketball with the fellas and win be clear. Um, I learned about uh, writing a lot there because I wasn't allowed to always go to the basketball court. Um, right. So that's where my infatuation and love for writing really, really came. I read books constantly um, yeah. and still do. I have a bit of a, I'm a bit of a bibliophile. Okay. Too many books. So tell me about the first book, the first writer who hmm. made literature real for you. I would say Sapphire. Um, and okay. I think which book was it? It was Push. Okay. But I think what happened, I had been reading and reading and reading everything and anything, of course, like you know the Judy Bloom and mm -hmm. uh, and and of course the Greats for School. But it was that book that changed my mind. I was like, oh, mm -hmm. I can write about everything. Like I don't have to hide where I'm from or uh, you know the struggles that I see my people face. Mm -hmm. I can write about that story and that too is worthy. Mm -hmm. And at one point when I was reading the book, it got so real for me that I threw the book across the room and I didn't touch it for like eight, nine you days. Threw the book across the room. Oh, it was too much. What part was it? Because I, I remember reading that book in like the seventh, I was in probably like seventh grade mm -hmm. and I was like, nah, this is, and not only was it rough, the language was rough too. Yep. So it was like double rough. Yep. Because it, it was like, I can't even understand what I don't understand right now. Like It was it was like no punches were held back. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, you are not safe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And as a reader, I had never experienced that before, where the writer wasn't really caring for my, my feelings. It was mm -hmm. like, this is the life that you're reading about. Mm -hmm. You either come into the room and you're ready for that, for that discussion, mm -hmm. or, you know, go get a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. um, so I threw it down when she got, when she was... Uh, diagnosed with HIV. Yeah. And I was like, come on, she can't win. <laughs> yeah, 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 and yeah. I didn't even realize, like, even then, you know, I was looking for some black girl magic. I was looking for black girls to win. And that that, that affected not, me. You were not getting that in that not book. Not in that, that, book. that book. No, no. So how old were you when you, that, when you discovered that book? Oh, gosh, I don't even remember. Um, age range, if you can't remember a particular I, age. I guess I would say eighth or ninth grade. Okay. And yeah. so... Let me now. Was into when you found that book? Did you was it? A, what was sort of the immediate sort of reaction to it? Not in terms of like how you react to it as a reader, but did you like put, try to put your friends onto it? I or did. Was it something you kept secret. Nah, I I tried to tell all my friends about it, but they weren't really into reading as much as I was. So when I brought it to them, they were like, Yeah, 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 okay, let's uh -huh. go to the pool. Uh, <laughs> To which I did, right? So you were like the only, were you like the only person, and pay me no mind, I'm, I'm preparing the Marduces. I'm, I'm watching this you. go yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. So we're we going to keep talking. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm getting this down to a science. But um, tell me, so you were the only one in your friend, amongst your friends. And what did your, like, one, were you the only one amongst your friends who read? And two, what was the composition of your friends? What did they look like? Were they a mix of older girls, younger girls, some dudes? What did it look like? Tell me. Um, the world. My really close friends, we were all of the same age. We were all in the same grade. Okay. And when I was playing ball, um, those were older dudes. Right. And I wouldn't necessarily say they were my friends. You know what I mean? Oh, I yeah, was yeah. 
I was just learning to get along. And, um, <laughs> and really, like, I think now, looking back, it was uh, an investigation of gender studies. You know what I mean? Like, okay. how does one get treated differently? So if I only play basketball, mm -hmm. then I'm not in danger of getting pregnant so I can probably go play. You know what I mean? Like, right. what are the rules? Whereas my cousins, they could go, my male cousins could go play wherever they want, whenever right. they wanted. Um, so, yeah, my friends growing up were mostly girls, even though, like, I was into a lot of sports. Uh -huh. um, and we were all in the same age range. Okay. But I was definitely the reader. The person who read with me, though, was my cousin. Okay. And she has the best name in the world. Her oh. name is Tiffany Fay. She's older. Okay. And she was the one, like, when and I read a your book. this is maternal or your paternal cousin? This is my, all right, so you asking a lot. This is my <laughs> paternal and maternal cousin. No, you're telling me a lot. Cousin, <laughs> on, cousin on both sides. Okay. Yeah, That's so, like, of... her parents were cousins to my father and my mother. Okay. You know, it's one of them parties, man. I'm going to have to ask you for a family <laughs> tree after and see how these branches, like, intertwine. Yeah, I know. All right, so of... Tiffany. Tiffany Faye. Um, she was the one that I talked to about my love of books yeah. and she's older than me by maybe three years, Okay. two years, three years. But even still, like she's the one that if I read something, mm -hmm. I can call and be like, yo, you got to read this joint. Right. And she will. And she loves it. <laughs> my so, <two> cents. <laughs> I want, you know it's funny you talking about the basketball thing. I went to actually went to high school at Grand Street. Okay. Over at the block. Um, went to EBT mm -hmm. or whatever. Shout out Grand Street. Shout out hey. EBT. Um, and we used to have this joke, the boys about the girls who were good. It was like I used to say this shit. Would be like you know the girls is good. All the girls who like don't like dick are the girls who's good at basketball. That was the ignorant slash very sexist assumption yeah. about Absolutely. women who are good at sports. And, you know, I realized at that time, like at that time, everything that had to do with a woman's power and ability to control, compose her body in a, in a space that was predominantly for men. Like the only way I understood and our friend, my friends understood it is if she was also a man she, right. or like a man. She could not be a sincere, like you couldn't like, like you said, like we used to say, you couldn't like dick and like basketball. That's. That's counterproductive. Like, that's right. counterintuitive or whatever. Right. And so, like, when you're saying that, I'm really thinking about, like, damn, like, how how much of my viewpoints were, like, really, co like, uh, dependent upon not believing, like, in a woman's true power. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That she has the capacity to play, you know, I play think, ball at the high level. I think we're all st still working through yeah, that, yeah, you know, yeah. young women and men. I definitely realized young, like, if I act like I like sports, then they don't think that I'm the one that could get caught up. But, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what it means to, uh, to like, be in a position of power only if you are taking up, you know, the model of power. Like, what does yeah, patriarchy yeah, 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 look yeah, like? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to act like that. I mean, I did, you know, for a very long time, which is why when we took the picture, I was like, I like looking mean. Right. Because I grew up around thugs. Uh, yeah. Because, like... You know, the best pictures was the prison poses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we, we model what we see as power. Yeah. And that comes from a lot of patriarchal ways. Yeah. And what's, I know it's like double funny for me. It's like the irony of that is like I wasn't even seen like growing up in bed style. Like I wasn't necessarily, I wasn't like a thug kid at all. Like I was like the kid that everybody thought was either gay or I, I used to get so many passes because like the rules didn't apply to me because I was like, yeah, you're not really a part of this. Hmm. Like, you in this, but you're not a part of this. So hmm. it's funny that, like, you know, I think because I was put on the outside of it so much, I, like, fought harder hmm. to try to be included. Of course. And so you do extra shit to try to... And of it's like, course. that shit don't... You know, it's even like, we, you know, I, like, girls would be looking at me like, Next, cut it out. Like, they'll accept that from them because mm -hmm. they stupid. But, mm -hmm. like, I expect more of you. I used to get frustrated because I'm like... Then why can't I get away with the with the fuck shit like they be getting mm -hmm, away with? And she's mm -hmm. like, nah, like get out of here. Like, like you know better. Like no, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that that's that's what will always happen to mm -hmm. me. I felt like every girl that I would try to front in front of was always like my mother. Mm -hmm. Like, now nah, you know you need to stop. And I'd be like, you right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Damn. And like scare you off or whatever. Like, don't tell nobody. This so you, you got a conscience though. Like they mm -hmm. said, you know better. You was like, Damn. You right. Like yeah, I do. I think a lot of it had to do also is with um I have like I had a I have like I think there's a there's a fear respect hmm. conundrum I have for women. Um 
because one I've seen, and I think that this is what makes, I think a lot of black men who grow up in pre predominantly women households, especially matriarchal households, it makes it very confusing for black men and men of color to understand that black women and women of color are not as strong as <laughs> the society. And like, like the, 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 the face that black women put on for the world is mm -hmm. not the reality of what they live, like what they live with every day. Like how that, like what has to be done to put that on, right? So perfect example I give you. I remember coming down Lewis Avenue. This was like in the early 2000s with my sister-in-law and her sister. And there was a girl who, you know, summertime shorty got on the sundress. Dude, like being wild and disrespectful. He like, mm -hmm. yo, what's going on, shorty? She like, I don't want to talk. you like, I right, fuck you, bitch. Mm -hmm. She like, all right, I'm coming back. And usually when someone says they coming back, I'm like, she's going to get a brother. She's going to mm -hmm. get an uncle. This woman comes back with her older sister. Hmm. Her older sister has a hammer, not not a gun, Jeez. but like she got a hammer, like a literal hammer. Hand to hand combat. And they went in on this dude. Hmm. Like this is a brawler dude with dress, and they were just taking turns fucking him up in the street. Hmm. And it was one of those things where it was like, when that is your point of reference, mm -hmm. like you know, you know, if you come from a, a you come from a world, I come from a world where they tell you boys don't cry. So you like, all right, girls do, but then the women in your family don't cry. Mm -hmm. You like, they, uh, who's supposed to cry at that right, point? Right. And so when that is my frame of reference for strength, mm -hmm. it's hard for me to see. Like in my mind, I don't see like, you know, like the like the uh, Issa Rae model, like an insecure. Mm -hmm. I don't see those cracks in the pavement mm -hmm. because there's so much being done to like sh make the the foundation strong, so you don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, getting older, I'm like. I've have to I had to do a lot of work going backwards. That's why I even said the thing about the assumptions that you, we made. Mm -hmm. Like we would say these things and the girls would laugh. And it so it never occurred to me like now nah, I must have fucked somebody up back then when we were mm -hmm. just joking, mm -hmm. which we weren't really doing. There was somebody who internalized that right. and kept it pushing and it's like they never let us see what that like what that felt like and now I'm like damn, there was a lot of feelings I heard thinking that those feelings didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Right? So um, I think it's funny because I think uh, all of those women exist in one body at the same yeah. time. And who that sister, it sounds like just the story and I don't know her, but who that woman sounds like to me was, you hurt my feelings and now I'm going to get the strongest woman I know who taught me to protect myself mm -hmm. so that you could never hurt my feelings again. Yeah. And sure, physically, we can get with you, but emotionally... Right? You've harmed me. And right, this is a thing that I'm going to have to, like, that's why my sister is willing to protect my name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you put, you know what I'm saying? You right. put me in harm's way. And I think that folks forget um, that black women have feelings. Like, yeah, we have this strong facade, mm -hmm. but uh, most of those things have been thrusted upon us, right? Mm -hmm. That we have to be the sole keeper in the family, or that we have to be the backbone of a community movement, or we have to be, you know, auntie to several babies, or we have to be mothers to several aunties to several babies. So we right. always are, are, are being a part of this community in a way that requires the matriarch right. and does not necessarily require your humanity, like you right. to break, you to be fractured. And if yeah. you are fractured, if you do break, what kind of woman is that? Right, it's not a woman. Like, in, at least in, depending on where you're from. Like, it's not the women that get in the movies. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. there's no damsel in distress with a black black woman face. Right. Well, and, that's, and that has to do a lot with the fact that, like, for black women to exist, they can't be damsels in distress, right? Yeah. Because, yeah. And that's why it's like, for me, that was a very subversive moment that I saw with her going to get her sister because mm -hmm. it's always about... Oh, I'm gonna go get the men, and so even men like they navigate society. Like you know that R. Kelly thing came out with mm. the, with him like running a cult or whatever the fuck he's running. Mm. Um, and in the comments, I always I tell my friends all this, this all the time. Like you know they be like, oh that's fake news, blah blah blah. Like I right, whatever. What's real is what's real is the response. Mm -hmm. The response is always real. And so when I look in the comments, and that's what I study because mm. that kind of let me know what the culture is. That's right. Um, there's dudes like where the fathers are, where where the fathers, and mm -hmm. it's like this assumption that a man's gonna be there is gonna prevent mm -hmm. this woman from doing 
prevent life from happening. Right. It's a very presumptuous thing. And it's the reason why, like... Present the, pre- prevent the predator. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like, that's a very, like, that's a, that's an, a, a heavy assumption. And it's also saying that women aren't capable of fending off predators themselves, which is not to say that that also isn't, in the, in the reverse, not true. But I think it also s- speaks to the fact that why don't we expect the same of women mm-hmm. as we do of men? Mm-hmm. And I think that, they'll, like, a lot gets said to us about what we're supposed to do in our lives based on the expectations that's had of us, Word. right? I wasn't, the reason why I got to even get to this place is because I was never expected to be the kid who like, somebody got jumped, like we're gonna get you done. No one, well, no one was calling me for that. Hmm. Like I was the kid you called when you wanted to pass a test. Mm-hmm. They're like, all right, we need you done up here because mm-hmm. we know he studied the test. And so because of those expectations, I was allowed, I was given a lot of passes right. on certain things. Like it wasn't even expected of me right. to do certain things. It's just like, that's not him. Right. right, and it's it's it, it's funny how like uh, for all that gets said about the hood and um, how much how much we pathologize it, mm-hmm. I, I see that in a, in a lot of ways. Even the lessons I got about uh, being myself in the hood, they came in these harsh lessons. But they oh, like it was weird. Like the people who taught me them was people who like they were like fucked up people, mm-hmm. and they had the best way of saying like get the fuck out of here. You mm-hmm. ain't got no parts of this, and all. and you'd be like damn. Okay. Mm-hmm. I remember I got robbed at 15. I was I'm gonna get a gun. And one of my man's uh rest in peace, his name is Daryl, he got killed by the police. Mm. But we were like hanging around or whatever, and he was like, if you get a gun, I'ma take it from you and beat you with it myself. And he embarrassed the fuck out of me in front mm. of everybody. And it was like in that moment, I was like, he taught me in retrospect that I wasn't about that life because it's like I was supposed to smack him. Mm. Because it's like, this is the life. Somebody just disrespected you. You're supposed to do that. And the fact that my resort was words at first, I was like, this isn't my life. Like, even if I had the gun Mm -hmm. and I put like, I'm like, if that person lives that life and I don't, what does me having a gun do? So I want to switch this to you. When did words become your way? How did and when did words become your way of fighting back? Not saying you're probably not good with your hands, but... You look like you go with your hand, <laughs> but I, you, I know you, you fight with, with the spoken, with the words. Yeah. So when did that become? When did you first realize that this was a way to fight? Um. So reading and writing from from fourth grade through was like a release, and then I thought, okay, I, I want to do this for a living. But it was in '98 uh, when I started working for this magazine in uh, Berkeley, California. And I was doing everything, yo. I was taking pictures, I was editing, I was writing, I was setting up interviews. Mm-hmm. I was like, it was like a, a one stop shop mm-hmm. that this brother ran out the back of his house. So, like, the cottage behind his house was where this all took place. And that's when I was like, oh, I definitely want to do this for sure. And though it was hip hop journalism, um, and I was writing about hip hop culture, right. I, I, I was. I was trying to find a way in um, in the canon that I never knew about before. You know what I mean? Like, I never mm-hmm. read, like, Time Magazine unless it was... So what was your canon at that time? Who was in your... Um, who was your, like... So for magazines, um, I was looking at, you know, the Essence, the Ebony. Right. Um, but I always had to, like, study Newsweek and Time. And those weren't necessarily parts of, like, my life at right. that point because I didn't find uh, the language to be very uh, accessible. Mm-hmm. The ideas, like, I could gather them, but, like, the language felt very jarring. So I would read, like, Murder Dog, which is the ultimate hood mag. I don't even think it exists anymore. Um, but it was all about the music culture as if you're having a conversation with someone. Right. So even the commas would be like, you know, nigga comma. You know what I mean? Saying, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And you're like, what? And yeah. you're reading it and folks in prison loved it because it was like someone was actually having a conversation with them right. about, you know, music that they loved. So I was trying to figure out a way to to merge all of those worlds and going to coming to New York City in 99, I think that was when I was, uh, I realized that there was something else. And 99, what, how old are you right at that point? 23. And you went to college? I went to college in California. I was going to be going into my junior year transferring to SFSU when I received a job offer in New York City. Working at <laughs> Hooked.com, okay. which is what Sean Puffy Combs attached himself to back when Uncle Rush had the 360 hip-hop. 
So remember, okay. they tried to take over, take over the internet oh, and yeah, have these yeah. hip hop magazines. The in, the, yeah, the internet boom. This is bef- yeah. the, before the big boom, right? Because okay. the crash did happen two years Around later. That time. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. So I was there. I was there trying to figure out like how my voice, you know, could really be valid and like really heighten the music that raised me um, mm-hmm. and how I came to terms with it. Right? I didn't realize I was a feminist. Until I wouldn't let a a person call me a bitch. But I come from Oakland, so all we know is two shorts, bitch, right? Mm -hmm. That's like my favorite word. Um, So it was like, why why can't you say this? And and having to write about that, trying trying to unpack those things. Um, And that's when I realized that it was a weapon. Um, And a lot of things happened in that world where I just didn't feel safe as a woman anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, The ways ways in which women writers were treated... um, you know, folks would do wild things. Like, it's in my memoirs. I'm, I'm working that out. They would do crazy things. So just in in the in this in the scene with everybody else, right, right. and men are super safe all the time. You know what I mean? But someone coming and putting their dick on my back in the middle of an actual writers' party, and me being like, "What the?" F-? And I do this. Like He's like, "Well, what you, like his, his, his response is what you like here his, for." His dick. In his pants. No dick is in his pants. Okay. No, nah, I'm just. But then either all is still disrespectful. All of it's, it's like the oh, most. No, I get it. But when but the I'm, response was get off me, he responded, "Well, what you here for?" Right. So I'm like, we're all here, but I see what you're saying. I'm out, and I'm one of those people that was lucky, right? Because who knows how many women didn't get to walk out of those situations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is when I turned back to the poetry. Um, I started poetry in '97, '98. And I left it to do the hip hop journalism, mm. and I came back to it after that because I was like, I gotta write this. Um, one of my interviews, <laughs> a dude threatened to pistol with me, yeah. And um, I came back. The the person you interviewed while I was, while we were interviewing, um, I came back Did to my you, editor. Like, challenging them. On- I asked him a very simple question, which was, um, you know, who mentored you? But I guess the way I said it made him think. I said. I don't know what he thought I said, but his his homie was like, no, 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 she from Oakland is cool, which meant like you just don't understand my language or something because then he put his gun back. But I left, went to my editor. I was like, all right, I wrote this thing. But in this thing, I wrote about how he tried to to assault me yeah. with a gun. And yeah. the response was, yeah, we can't do that. You know, uh, we got advertising dollars with they, they uh, record label for the next six months. So just just talk about the writing. Just talk about the music. And I was like, the music is trash. It doesn't matter. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But this other thing is really important. And that's when I was like, ah, I'm just a, a, a fucking sheep. It don't matter what happened to me in these, in these streets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So poetry then became the only weapon. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I started writing from a, a, a space that I never thought I had the power to before, which was, you know, angry and assertive and... Um, open and kind and charging and political and black as fuck. Mm. Um, so Redbone, which is that joint, was yeah. all about my mother. This is the first collection, right? This is the first um, full-length collection. Okay. I did plenty of chat books before. Now explain, because this is a lot of what this platform is about, is about translating what we do to the outside world. Got right? it. So what is a chat book? So a chat book is 46 pages and under. Okay. Um, I also self-published for years so from 2001 through 2000 you found a penmanship yes found right. a penmanship books as a response to uh folks telling me that they didn't have no place you know like yeah. we don't we don't know who your audience Audiences, is the markets the markets and i literally was just off of a two-month tour in europe and i'm like i just performed to thousands of people yeah. that's my audience and right. I'm like mm, but it's over there and i was like copy yeah. so a penmanship was founded and this, soul this, books handle with this uh that was 2001 okay so this okay all mm-hmm. right so 2002 actually okay i would say like the end of 2001 and that was it I, it was like i was like a freight train i would take no shorts i wasn't saying no i was selling books out of my my bag masterpiece um, exactly ah. exactly <laughs> um and then i started like doing anthologies with other women ah. Um, this joint called His Real, which is still life changing work in there, and then offering um, opportunities to other other poets that I saw doing the kind of work that I was doing, but not receiving the nod because they weren't a part of the literary the literary canon. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. we were your spoken word, which I think is mad divisive. Like I speak words, I read poems well, but it's not spoken word, yeah. right? 
Yeah, so like the chat book is like the EP. Yep. And then the collection is like the album. Like yep. that's the way. That's a good way to say it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I had hella chat books hella for EPs. years. Hella, hella EPs, mixtapes. All of them. All of them. <laughs> I was drinking it. <laughs> um, so that came out in 2014 yeah. and uh, got an NAACP nomination. A. Hey. Um, uh, I mean, who was in that joint? That was Ross Gay, Nate Marshall, Carl Phillips, me, and Terrence Hayes. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, so, what language, and this is another thing, mm-hmm. um, Talk we talk about in literature and the conversations, we always talk about the voice. Voice is very important. But I feel like I was talking to John Maria about this, and I've, I've been learning to talk about poetry Learn to read poetry better once I started to realize that when you read poetry, you cannot read one poem. Mm-hmm. But the way poetry gets taught in school is you often only ever given one poem. Yeah. And no I've, hand out. I've made that example of like, that's like hearing like, like James Brown speak once mm. and then he walks off. Mm. And it's like, I'm not going to understand James. I'm saying, before. please. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> and, and then he leaves. It's like, poem, mm. you got to listen to that man talk. Mm. Till you realize, oh, that's his language. Mm-hmm. Or it's like if somebody's from a different, you know, region, mm-hmm. and they got different words for the same things. You got to listen to go. Okay, what is the, what are they really saying? Mm-hmm. But with poems and poetry, we don't get taught voice, mm-hmm. right? We mm-hmm. get taught words, which is I think very different. Like, right. so how would you describe your own voice if somebody's reading you? How do how do I know Ooh. I'm reading a mahogany brown poem? Right, that's hard. Um, I think the one thing that I've been trying to tangle yeah. in my voice um, are the women, are the matriarchs of my life. Mm-hmm. So I bring in the Louisiana of my grandmother and I bring in um, my grandmother raised, you know, eight human beings and paid for a house by winning money at the track. Thug sickle, right? Um, my, my, that's my paternal grandmother. Mm-hmm. My maternal grandmother um was like a boss for the state of California um, accounting department, brought other people up under her from Texas. Yeah. So the, the twang is always present in my language, um, especially because I was told not to talk like that. Yeah. And I'm like, the women who raised me talk like that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if the code switching happens, you can't tell me you don't understand what I mean when I say um, they gone. Like, you know what I'm saying. Right, right. They're not gone. They is hella gone. They gone. They been gone. You late. Right. right, right, right. They, there's some urgency to the they and the gone. So having that twang and having them present in my work is um, is something that I tangle with and make sure it's embedded. But also keeping the, um, the music alive in the melodies that I create, yeah. which I learned from Nina Simone, right. um, who, like, even when she spoke in interviews, it felt like a song was happening. Yeah. Right. And I feel like that when I listen to like '90s R&B, uh, shout out to them babies and um, the blues, right? Okay. Ma Rainey and them, um, but also you know hip hop, which is a, a very large part of my life right. and brought me to poetry in a way that I don't think I would have come to had it not thrust me out. So who who who? Give me some artists who brought you to poetry. Um, for certain, uh, Jay Z. Okay. Uh, Sugar Free, DJ Quick, um, DOC, um, Ice Cube. Um, I like Drake now. I know people don't like him, but I think he's great. I think he, he makes me feel fun. I like listen and I just sing everything with a melody. It's, nah, yeah, not, it's I think, amazing. I mean, he, 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 I think he's mastered the art of making himself listen listenable. Mm-hmm. And, and he's highly emotional. Yeah. Which and, I think... We we condition out of men, so to yeah. see somebody be, but that, but at the same time, I, I I do feel like Drake is also one of those guys that like what I've seen is him turn emotion into a sort of capital mm-hmm. that he's not necessarily that invested in. Maybe. So it's like when Who's I listen, to say? listen, huh? Who's to say his his music? Okay, because all you really have, right? I don't know his personal life. I'm mm-hmm. looking at the music, and mm-hmm. I'm listen, I'm listening to. The composition of the records Mm -hmm. of the guy who is forlorn about this woman who he knows he won't commit to. Right. Because there's several times where he'll say, like, you know, I can't I have a bigger purpose. If you're not with this, then you might as well forget. Let's forget it if you're not with the bigger picture. Right. Right. But then you mad when Shorty goes off and gets married. Which is 
several of my cousins, which right. is two of my uncles, which is the men in our lives. Right. And I get that. So it totally made sense to no, me. No, and it, it makes sense to me too. But at the same time, it's when you hear that over a series of albums mm -hmm. and you hear that same sentiment, but no sort of like, what is that sentiment founded on? To me, it's like, okay, what are you really trying to say? Is this something, are you performing yourself? Mm. Or are you trying to really see like what is really at the, at the, at the behest of this? So like for me, it's like, Listen to four 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 like the Jay Z right. song we you know talks about. Cheating. It's a grown ass man. Right. But no, okay. but listen. You, I'm I'm just no. I, like, listen. So, I'm just just I'm so just I'm the it, hype it, man. It's a grown ass man, but mm -hmm. being a grown ass man is a choice too. Yes, he but you he grew into that because be clear. Yeah. Hustler baby, which is still my jam, yeah. right? It didn't just happen overnight that he stopped saying bitch. Right. It didn't just happen overnight that he stopped being a, a, a cheater, yeah. right? I yeah. just think Drake is going to grow into that space. I believe that too. Right? I, I think I think he will. But okay. I don't think he's the best ever. By no, I know. And I don't I just, think that either. I think that like he, like, I, like to me when I hear it, it's like when you express the same sentiment the same way. And you package it differently because the beats sound different and mm -hmm. you hear the beats switch up and things like that. It's like, it makes it seem like there's a progress with that. Mm. And I feel like with his sound, with what he's capable of, the fact that he's breaking new genres and mm -hmm. things like that, mm -hmm. I feel like those are all true. Mm -hmm. But what's also true is to me, it's like that emotional thing that he's doing. And I, and, I, and that's why I brought up the 444 thing is because it wasn't until 444 that I realized that song crowd wasn't as mature. Hmm. As I had thought it to be. I hear that. It would, in the sense that, like, on Song Cry, he says, you know, I, I got to live with the fact I did you wrong forever. Mm -hmm. But he didn't ever say sorry. No. He was just like, I fucked you over. I was going to get right back. Yeah. That's all the only excuse But that's all you're going to get. Mm -hmm. But on 444, he says, the I apologize. Proper apology. And mm -hmm. then when I hear the apology, I'm like, oh, snap. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember, like, and I said this, like, Blueprint was, to me the jay-z album because that was the first jay-z album where i felt like i wasn't listening to a character yeah like all the first albums was like it's a persona he wants yeah. me to buy into yeah blueprint felt like the first opening up mm. and so you applaud the first opening up but then when i hit fourth and i hit that album I'm like oh no this and i know like it's a it's an adult thing mm -hmm. and i appreciate that but mm -hmm. that's why i said from drake it's like and maybe it is the fact that because he's so open you expect more open mm -hmm. and i don't necessarily expect open all the time i expect nuance okay and that's to me what i feel like because his sound like i've mm -hmm. listened to old like raps and you know he end up like he used to always have like these like pauses in his flow and like those are gone mm. and so there's mm. so many things he's improved on it's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. i really want to get like what does a marvin's room look like yeah Later. You want the emotional growth. I just I yeah. understand the stagnancy. And, yeah. I understand the stagnancy. I still see it. But I think it's not fair to compare him to Jay Z because Jay Z has lived a full life. I'm not comparing him to Jay Z. I say that to say you brought up four forty four. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. As a comparison. Right. And I'm thinking the comparison happened because you actually have seen the growth, right? You could see it because it's years and years and years. Whereas Drake who may be a little stagnant emotionally, right. I think 10 years from now, I yeah. still think he'll be around. And I think that... Oh, he's going to be around. I, I hope that it will happen. I, yeah. But see, know. for me, it, it's not even like... The, the comparison. The reason why I made the comparison is because only in retrospect did I realize he didn't do something early. Gotcha. And so until he does it, I don't even recognize that the first thing I thought he did, he didn't really do. Gotcha. Right? So yeah. for me, it's like with... Drake, it's like even if he acknowledges the fact in a real way, mm -hmm. like Marvin's room was the that was like a real acknowledgement. Like you are really you one of those guys, and like mm -hmm. a lot of guys mm -hmm. are those guys. But to me, that was like a real mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. And I still say like take care is this man's magnum opus until I see something else. Mm -hmm. But I felt like from there, it's like he's pushed these other things, like pushed boundaries mm -hmm. in these other places, and it's been taken as a whole. Like oh, he's he's. As a person, he's moving forward. Right. And that's why I appreciated the last verse. I mean, the last verse on, um, what is it? Uh, More Life, where he says, I'm going to take a break and I'm going to get back to you when I come back. And I really feel like with everything he's doing, when your business and your your brand, mm -hmm. your personhood kind of gets put on hold. Absolutely. And so I, I, I like, that's what I said. I, I still bang with his music. Yeah. I just also want. You're looking for more. The, the art. Yeah. I think who, who made me want more, though, was most deaf. Okay. Um, because at all times, I felt like he was transitioning 
Yeah. And he was showing these different modes and these different moments. And he showed, you know, the Ratchet and the Renaissance in the same album. I like that, Ratchet and the Renaissance. That's a good book title. Should be. But at the <laughs> same time, to show, like, you know, the multitude and the complexity that we have as a people. Yeah. Um, and that it didn't have to happen as, as a form of code switching and um, a defense mechanism, but mm-hmm. as uh, an example of, you know, how we sustain ourselves and how we... Um, we we have made all these parts of our life and still are these full bodied and actualized people. Mm-hmm. So I would add him to my list. Okay, for sure. Any look, I listened to Lil Kim hardcore on repeat you know while what? I was pregnant. Right, the... <laughs> to which my daughter loves Lil Kim and now right. listens to Cardi B. I think it's you know yeah, y'all it, listen it all... to Cardi B on the way over here. Yes, you, you know I said this and I got attacked. Remember, um, we was actually talking about it in the studio. Um, I was like, and people are probably gonna drag me for this. I don't give a fuck. But I feel like people need to like listen to the what I'm what I'm really saying and not the words only. Okay. But I feel like Cardi B is to this generation mm-hmm. what Grace Jones was to her generation. Hmm. Now, when I say that, what I'm looking at is not what Cardi B is doing, but the effect it's having on the people she's doing it for. Right. So when I look at the fact that there was a video she posted where she was at a concert mm-hmm. and everybody in the crowd was women. Mm. I've never seen that for a female mm. artist. There's usually a lot of dudes because mm-hmm. hip hop is a dude sport, mm-hmm. right? And so even like Lil' Kim, I love Lil' Kim. Like I actually like, a lot of dudes look like, they call me sus because I know all the words to Not Tonight. Mm-hmm. Like, and I rap them. Like I don't change the flow. Because it's a good song. It's a fucking good song. <laughs> and I, like I know all, this, all the words. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I, there is a thing where like, the, like the Kims, the Nickies, mm-hmm. like there's a performance for the male gaze. Mm-hmm. To me, I feel like a Cardi B is performing for a female gaze. Mm-hmm. That's how I read her. And to me, I think you're right. I think she does perform with with no fucks to give about what dudes think. Yeah. I, and I think the reason women like her so much is that not only does she say the things that we say when we are not in mixed company, mm-hmm. right? But she doesn't change. Her language or her tone. Yeah. Like, at all. So she doesn't... It doesn't matter if you understand her, if you agree or not. Right. She's saying it um, with, like, only other, you know, other sisters in mind. Mm-hmm. And I think that's dope. Yeah, because even I was watching the Love & Hip Hop reunion thing, and, like, the two girls was going at each mm-hmm. other. She was like, y'all need to trash him. Yep. And Yo, Why y'all fighting each other? Yeah, he did like, this. like Absolutely. he needs to get this or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And at the time, like, everybody's thing was like, you a nobody, you're not going to be nothing. And it was just like, I've watched the way she's moved. And mm-hmm. I like, like I said, I'm back reading them comments. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm looking who she's doing things for. And some people are like, oh, she's not progressive blah 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 and it's like every woman is not going to connect with an audrey law to bell hooks piece mm-hmm. that's not what most women are right so cardi b can catch a yeah. deer yeah, yeah yeah right but but that's and, not all women no you're right sure and and if cardi b is a threshold for which people walk through to even meet understand people, feminism then why is she why can't she be there is no one way to be a feminist right. what i hate the most about this now culture is that people even fix their mouths to say Amber Rose and Cardi B is not Coretta mm-hmm. or Bell Hooks yeah. or Audre Lorde, which is to say the respectability politics are at play. Yeah. If you are a feminist, there is no way that you can be anti-woman and a feminist. Right, like right, you right. just not. You yeah. are a patriarchal body, right. and you need to stop fronting. Yeah. Um, but but again, when you get that position of power, some people would rather be the oppressor right. than to like. You know, and abolish the system. And that's why I said, like, I see that, like, that Bodak Yellow song, and I see women rap to that mm-hmm. the way men be rapping to, mm-hmm. like, T-shirt, mm-hmm. right? And the only other time that I've seen that in that sort of, like, I don't give a fuck who sees me doing what I'm doing is when, like, Flawless came out. Yep. And when women were that like, right. like it was, it, it was that like, I don't right. give a fuck yeah. sort of thing. Whereas, like, like I said, like, Lil' Kim, like, I love Lil' Kim, but it was always a thing that she, she you did, she did care. Not necessarily, but like who the pros was for. Yeah. It was like, I want to be nasty for like men. I want men to know I'm nasty. As opposed to like, I'm nasty. I don't give a fuck if you like it or not. I think it was a little bit of both. Okay. I I think she awakened like the sexual revolution for the hip hop generation. Oh, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. At that time. And because of that, it was still like this learning curve. Um, 
and of course, like the personal definitely colored how we viewed, mm-hmm. you know, what she was doing and what she was saying. I don't know. When, because when, when I, I say when this, I'm I not say, comparing it like it's a like she's like it's a better yeah, it, no, no, no. I'm saying it I don't as, think it's like, better or this worse. Is, this, is like a, this is like a reference point of looking at yeah. the timeline. Because, like, there's other, you know, women MCs, like No Name, mm-hmm. like Rhapsody, Ciroc. Like, there's a lot of women MCs who do not perform for a male gaze, mm-hmm. but they're also not getting fader interviews. They're also not getting yeah. magazine covers. They're not getting these things that, to the average person, would legitimize what they have to say. Right. So, to see someone like Cardi B do what she's doing and get the reach i to, think i think i have an articulation for it okay. i think cardi b does what you say she speaks to women about women yeah i think little kim which had never happened before in this way speaks about the sexual the sexual being right to women amongst men so that it was uh, okay. a way in which we can enter the room and stay in the room yeah and the objectification um, it was kind of turned on its side. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so like she was because, the girl who like, like, like you, by the door. You could totally be sexy and still be around all the homies. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't know. I'm going to have to think about that more. Okay. We might need a part two. But I, yeah. I, I think yeah. you're onto something. Yeah. I've been, but you're going to get in trouble. Yeah, I'm going to get in trouble. That's what I don't mm-hmm. give a fuck because that's what I think. And, and the reason why I'll say it is because I thought about it. Mm-hmm. Like, this was something I've been sitting on because mm-hmm. you can't. Because you know, it's like you make that comparison. People go, hell no, she's not Grace Jones. I'm, like, I'm not saying she's Grace Jones. I'm not right. saying. I'm I'm looking at the response. I'm looking at like college girls teach her mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in feminism classes. Right. Like she's becoming curriculum. Right. And so that to me is like, that's impact. Right. Right. And like for all that's being said, I'm like, that's big. When I saw her, all the women in, in a crowd knowing her words, mm-hmm. word for word, mm-hmm. I'm like, damn, like I've never seen that before. Right in that sort of way and I was like that and it's it, it's like not even no men and you and the thing is like she don't need men right. to uh, co-sign it right. and that's what I, I, I really thought that was dope but um this red bone I read um parts of it okay. I read interviews about it okay and the media thing of course I thought of was the Childish Gambino song and and and, and mine was parent, first. And I, I know. I make know, sure we're we not we're not we're not doing that. But I I, I, I I mean he got the Emmy and whatnot. Mine was <laughs> first. <laughs> I think it was like what I loved about it was mm. like you talk about your mother who is a light skinned woman. Mm-hmm. You're a darker skinned woman. Mm-hmm. But there's not that there's a there's an empathy of understanding how her experience informs your own mm-hmm. and the pieces mm-hmm. and how you move and how like your mother even learns about her her position mm. and like how even in like to somebody who's like on the second floor the fifth floor looks higher but it's not the, it's not the you know it's still a ceiling exactly right and i think that that's what that um poetry collection if i'm mistaken let me know i like it but i really felt like that's what that that's what a lot of times in these conversations when we do like you know color privilege pretty privilege and all these types mm-hmm. of privileges that exist we look at the privilege as power mm-hmm. and not as privilege. Mm-hmm. It's like you got one up on me, mm-hmm. but you probably like five below what I really think power is. Like right. you work at McDonald's and you work on fries, but that don't mean you own the chain. Like right. it's, and I felt like that book was doing that in a way that sometimes we, you know, we mix up the forest for the trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would love for you to read a poem from there. From there. Okay. Just to pop one open, and while you, you know what? Before we do that, let's let's get this Marduse flowing. Let's get it. Cause all right, so that you, before you grab that, mm-hmm. all right. So this is I'm I'm, I'm gonna walk you through the Mar- Marduse. Okay. No, you gotta you gotta do it with me. It's an interactive. Oh, oh okay. Uh, endeavor. So you all gotta right. pop your pop your top. You hear that? Hear that snap? That snap that, is always letting that's you know it's real. Fresh, right. So then you're gonna drink past the leaves. The leaves. Past the leaves. Copy. All right. I knew that was going to happen. You, 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 you. <laughs> All right, now. Okay, you good? Wait, no. A little bit more. All right. I'm going to pour you up. Okay. Get you, Can I get a napkin? Get you right. Do we have a napkin? Mm. I feel like a... Mm. Oh, my gosh. It sounds like it's going to be a, a real deal. All right. All right so you, Put it you, back. You, just, you get your, your, your clockwise swirl on. Got it. Get your swirl on. Right? Mm-hmm. All right. Then. Oh, my God. That smells like a lot of <laughs> dreams. Thank you. Mm, you got you. You good? I'm great. All right. Cool. 
then you yawn. Okay. All right. Then Cheers. Boom. Thank you for being on the lit, girl. Thank you for having me. Oh, my God. That's so sweet. <laughs> Too sweet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gotta drink it twice just to make sure. It's delicious. This is like a dessert. Yeah, it's a dessert. You know, I, I'm not a big drinker. And I, I don't always drink, but when I do, I drink Marduce. It's a, it's a drink that goes down easy and doesn't come up rough. I can't take you. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I, I love I love the branding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't want to get sued. Let's do a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> so, wanted to get you refreshed. Yeah. Get your vocals ready for going this. Going down. For this, for this okay. reading. Anything you want to hear particularly? Um, The Betty Says. I like Betty Says. Okay. So, Betty was a real, she was a real stunner. So, yeah, put, put, put context on this so right. that people watching and they know how to listen. Okay. Uh, Betty says was my grand aunt. Mm -hmm. She is the sister of um, my grandfather, mm -hmm. and she was a hustler. She um, she kept a switchblade, she kept a purse, and she's the one that taught my grandmother how to bet on horses and win. So, um, and she ain't, she That's some Bessie Smith shit. That ass. She ain't stand for no foolishness. You know what I mean? She yeah. didn't. She didn't. And I remember her being, mm, I want to say late 70s, early 80s, feeble, right? In stature, mm -hmm. short. But when she thought somebody took her bag, like my, my, my uncle, I think he like moved it to go to the restroom or something. And she went to swinging on him. Mm -hmm. At 80. Now, look, she didn't have the ability, right? To really connect with him. But she was like... She was swinging to connect. And they were like, what's going on? Like, what is wrong? She's like, my bag. Like, she would say it, and it, it was the yeah. most empowering moment I've ever, like, felt. Yeah. I was like, yo, she will stop you from getting her things even now. Be clear. Right. Betty's a beast. Betty says, she taught her sister-in-law three things. One, how to cock a gun. Two, how to bet on race horses and win. Three, how to run, why to run, and when to stand up. A cigarette stiff on the cliff between her lips the entire time. Yeah. So it's a couple of vignettes yeah, in there. Yeah, that's what I like. Because to me, I felt like Betty says is like, Umi. Mm -hmm. like Word. Like, like a philosophy. Like, Shine your light on the what, world. What, what, what would Betty do? Mm -hmm. like that's what, that needs to be a bumper sticker. Not something. actually play. She, yeah. she didn't have time for the foolishness. Yeah. Um, so, talk to me about what you got in the works now. I know you have the Black Girl Magic. Yes. So, this they, joint right here. They, oh, they've been doing it the whole... Too sweet, too sweet. So, this joint um, was picked up by uh, Roaring Brook Press, which is a part of Macmillan Publishers, okay. um, as a hardcover. Mm -hmm. And comes out in January. Okay. I'm super excited. Okay. Uh, the artwork um, is amazing, and it's just really a poem that was illustrated, brought to life. Okay. The poem is uh, something I did for PBS called Black Girl Magic. Yeah. Um, and I didn't even plan on doing it. It was one of those, can you do a poem about whatever you want to talk about? And I thought, I want to talk about that black shit. Yeah, like, yeah, And yeah. I want to talk about black women. And I did it, and, it, and the, the, the video went viral. Yeah. So from that, I thought I should get a you know something to commemorate this poem, mm -hmm. um, especially in this time. You know. Now, what is your definition of black girl magic? Because everyone has their own um, inter very interesting right. in your, your interpretation of it. Right. Um, I think the resilience, uh, the beauty, the strength um, of black women, black girls, despite a world trying to tell them, you know, that they don't exist, mm -hmm. that they're negative. Um, that they're hard to love, mm -hmm. that they're hard to remember. I think the magic to hold hold yourself uh, lovingly after all that um, is what makes up, you know, just really the, not the platform that is Black Girl Magic because mm -hmm. I know that it's a hashtag and I've been using it for some years now. Uh, but, like, I know that people are trying to trademark it, which I think is kind of nasty. It's That's weird to me. Right, like it's how because culture is always that. How you trademark power to the people? 
yeah. how you trademark a moment in which black women see themselves and love themselves and it, and it wasn't anyone's ownership of that black woman's right. happiness and yet here we are again watching these corporations and these moguls yeah. try to yeah. you know uh, and then that becomes the thing right because it's like right the cultural movements is like like who has like trademark of the word hip hop right but it's right. like if you don't trademark mm-hmm. it then you run the the risk of someone trademarking it and then doing what they want to it mm-hmm. so I'm like I'm more like does trademark in the right hands become a way to preserve what it is mm. you know I think uh, it's it's for the people I yeah. think how I how I I speak about Black Girl Magic is not necessarily how someone else will speak about it, and that is okay. Yeah. All of those can exist at the same time. One does not negate the other. Okay, so let, can you read? Let's can you can get some some reading. Uh, you want me right to now? read the poem? Yeah, I have it memorized. No, right, we can do that. You wanna you wanna read along? Yeah, I'm gonna. Okay. Yeah, and this drops when? Jan January. January. January twenty eighteen. So you about to read the poem? Make sure you look at this book cover. You don't, you don't need this. <laughs> it's gonna All be right. great. All right. Take us through it. So this is the roll call. These are all the women that mm-hmm. allow me to be in the room and mm-hmm. all the women to come. They it. say you ain't supposed to be here, black girl. You ain't supposed to wear red lipstick. You ain't supposed to wear high heels. You ain't supposed to smile in public. You ain't supposed to smile nowhere, black girl. You ain't supposed to be no more than a girlfriend. You ain't supposed to get married. You ain't supposed to want no dream that big. You ain't supposed to dream at all. You ain't supposed to do nothing but carry babies and carry felons and carry weaves and carry silence and carry families and carry confusion and carry a nation, but never an opinion. Because you ain't supposed to have nothing to say, black girl, not unless it's a joke. Because you ain't supposed to love yourself, black girl. You ain't supposed to find nothing worth saving in all that brown. You ain't supposed to know that Tina, Beyonce, Cecily, Shonda, Rhymes, shine, 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 black girl. You ain't supposed to love your mind. You ain't supposed to love. You ain't supposed to be loved up on. You only supposed to pose voodoo child, vixen style. You're supposed to pop out babies and hide the stretch marks. You're supposed to be still. So still they think you statue. So still they think you chalked outline. So still they keep thinking you stone. Until you look more Medusa than Viola Davis. Until you sound more Shanae then Kerry Washington. And to your more side-eyed than Michelle Obama on a Tuesday. But you tell them you are more than a hot comb in a washing set. You are Kunta Kinte's kin. You are a black girl worth remembering. And you are a threat knowing yourself. You are a threat loving yourself. You are a threat loving your kin. You are a threat loving your children. You black girl magic. You black girl fly. You black girl Brit. You black girl wonder. You black girl shine. You black girl bloom. You black girl. Black girl and you turning into a beautiful black woman. Right? Before our eyes. Boom. That was lit. <laughs> that was dope. That was dope. That's that do so. That was dope. It gives you a second life. It gives you a second life. Um, so tell us where can people find you mm-hmm. on the interwebs? I'm Mo Brown everywhere. Mo Brown. At M O B R O W N E. Okay. Website, Instagram, okay. Twitter. All that. All they that. won't let me have no more friends on Facebook. But oh, they blocked you. You you're too popping on the on the it's book. It's I don't get it. You're too popping on the How book. you tell people how many friends they can have? That's weird. That's that's, that's Mark Zuckerberg's move. That's the way you do it. You have followers. Quite oppressive. <laughs> um, and what you got coming up? Uh, any events? Places where people can find you? What so you, I'm at doing? Brick. Um, we do the Brooklyn Slam once a month, and it's free to the people for okay. the people. Um. They have information. Yeah, you can go to bric.org. Okay. Yeah. Um. And I'm here. I'm in Brooklyn. You're in Brooklyn. Yeah, writing. Doing what? Living. Writing, living. That's it. Okay. Um. So if you want to follow Mo, she gave you the info. Yeah. I got bars too. Eight. Hey. Um. If you want to follow, you know, more of what's going on with Lit, uh, follow at Lit Platform on all the handles. Mm-hmm. This is your Don Israel. This is oh shit. Before I leave, before Where we leave. Where you going? What are we oh, doing? What are we doing? I need your literary swag. What's I never got your three writers. Okay. And your three clothing designers. Ah, okay. Uh. Almost mm, forgot that. I'm... Three writers. It's like my forever writers. 
This is, this is, I mean, you come back, it could change. Okay. So this is like. So right now, who I'm like, who's next to the bed would be. I like that. Octavia Butler. Okay. Uh, James Baldwin. That's like the guy. Um, and Jasmine Ward. Mm. Um, she's scully. Uh, <laughs> on the other side of the bed, I'm playing. I won't yeah, tell yeah, you. Yeah. I won't tell you all of the books, but um, the three designers, mm-hmm. the African dude up on Nostrand. Okay. This is my guy. Okay. <laughs> no shit in Fulton. Okay, make sure we're not giving this to the wrong guy. Like, yeah, that's what do. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm an African. He's dude. amazing. He's amazing. He's amazing. Good people. And, you know, quick. Um, who else? I don't. Hmm. Ace, I like ASOS. I don't know who. Does that? Yeah, we'll it's a that. couple of people, we'll, we'll but they that. they make things for the curvy body, which I appreciate. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> and I I love me shoes. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. So I have a couple of pair of Hirachis. They. Oh yeah, the Hirachi is the my. But I make my own now. What's so you, what, what does that mean? Like I have you know all salmon pink, with my name on the back. Oh okay. Oh, you then I got some iridescent yellow joints. I don't, yeah. And uh, that's a fly. That's a flower. I don't know what that mm-hmm. means. Isn't that? Like it's this, like, like lighter than that yellow on the Zadie Smith book there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Iridescent. All right. So I glow in the dark. You always glow. <laughs> shining, shining. Mo is on the glow. This is your Don Israel <laughs> with Mo Mahogany Brown. This is yes. lit, and we out. <laughs>